<laughs> well, to see this movie again is to fall in love with it all over again. And it's, it, you know, there's so many places to start. I think maybe the simplest is best. I remember seeing it for the first time, and, and I was already thinking of La Dolce Vita when you have a little clip of La Dolce Vita. I thought, interesting, because the feeling is there, but I wondered, you know, if, if you don't mind, if you can remember, what, what is it about Fellini's La Dolce Vita that so spoke to you that maybe you were recreating or speaking back to with this film? Um, yeah, and also I thought of Roman Holiday. Uh -huh. and, um, but, yeah, Dolce Vita, I think, just, you know, a charmed moment and, um, and Marcello and, you know, just ex experiencing a moment of a charmed life. So. Right, right. I mean, you know, there's so... Uh, one so it's a fantasy, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it has that... I mean, you communicate the feeling of insomnia so well at the beginning of the film, and then there's a kind of joyous sleeplessness that, that takes over, where you a feeling of being up all night, which is very sweet. The thing that I guess I love most about the film is that we can't hear what he's saying to her at the end. It's, it's so... It's so <laughs> I never thought that would be such a thing that people would ask me about. Um, well, it's, it's funny. It's like, uh, to be clear, I'm not asking you what he's saying, because I think it's funny that you give a private moment to the characters, and one of the things that seems to be a constant in your work, I, because I ask myself, okay, why am I in such suspense here? Nothing obvious is happening, and yet I'm completely involved with what I'm looking at, and I feel like you're catching moments of privacy. You really value the privacy of the characters, and you kind of, at the moment, that, at that decisive moment, they kind of become themselves again. They're, they're withdrawing to their lives on us at, at that point. Yeah, and I like when people would ask Bill Murray, what did they say? And he said, oh, it's you know, between them. And, um, and I like that they have this little intimate moment that you know you feel a part of. And for me, I ended the, 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 the feeling I wanted to have between them and the sentiment without having to you know, articulate. Yeah. Where did, I mean, you say a charmed moment, but you know, to, to achieve this kind of spontaneity, there's a feeling of spontaneity is there, like you, you feel like you know, the old Orson Welles line that a director presides over accidents, and I feel like yeah, there's like a million amazing accidents that are happening here, but you know, that doesn't happen <laughs> by accident in itself, it's like how did you how did you prepare to go catch this, what were you what, can you remember what you were seeking? Yeah, I mean a big part of, when I wrote the script, it had to be Bill Murray, I pictured Bill Murray, so, and I wasn't going to make the movie if it wasn't Bill Murray and I knew that he there were enough ingredients, and then having him take us all along, I felt like that would be enough for me to want to watch. So, luckily, he agreed to yeah. do the movie. And I remember seeing an interview with um, Fellini that Sam Cassavetti told me about, um, where he says, um, you know, I, it's like going on a trip. I just, you, you have your passport, and you have, you know, where you're going, but you, then you, when you get there, you see what happens. And I, I like that approach, because I don't like to plan everything out, but you have enough of an itinerary, and then you see where it takes you. Right, right. And, I mean, I know that there's a, a kind of a, a bit of a legend that grew up around me that you weren't sure even until the last minute whether you had Bill Murray for sure. And uh, how, how, yeah. can you talk a little about that? Yes, it was a very nerve-wracking experience. I, I stalked Bill Murray for a year or so, and he was very hard to reach. And um, even a friend of mine knew him and, and even when he sounded like he agreed to do it he still wouldn't um, he wanted to book his own travel He so we didn't know if he was going to show up and I was already in, in Japan spending money mm. hope, with the hope that Bill Murray would show up and then <laughs> luckily he did show up so it was nerve wracking and um, I'm glad he showed up did he, did he ever give you any explanation or did you need one from him you just trusted him he's just him. an elusive elusive guy and, and then he fired his agent and we can track him down, and, and yeah, it was, and yeah, I was so desperate because I, I knew it would be good if he could do it. Like I, I just had this idea in my head, and I wasn't going to do it with someone else. And and then I was trying to. I remember being on a plane next to, um, for some sports person. And I knew that Bill liked golf, and I remember thinking like, do they know Bill Murray? And, and it was just, um, yeah, it was it was just endless. I was really obsessed with tracking him down, and. Um, Yes, I'm still luckily yeah. grateful that he... Well, he's managed to be elusive on camera, so, I mean, it's no question why you're dedicated mm -hmm. to getting him. I mean, because once you go out him live, he does magnetize everything around him, so... Yeah.
But what uh, what was it about? I mean, how early did you cast Scarlett Johansson? Did you write it with her in mind, having the panoply of actors at your fingertips, or did you? Um, I'm trying to remember. I, I had, yeah, I had him in mind, and it was sort of my fantasy if I could hang out with Bill Murray in Tokyo at that moment in my life. I wanted him to to kind of show up, and um, and I I remember seeing her in Nanny and Low, which she was like 12 years old, and, and I, I loved her kind of deep husky voice, and she, I, I wanted that character to be a little bit like Lauren Bacall, or, mm-hmm. um, so I had her in mind, but um, I don't remember at what, what point, I guess after I wrote the script, I, yeah. I had her in mind. How about um, Tokyo itself? I mean, are you, were you very experienced with Tokyo already, or, or was it just something that you had a taste of and just intuitively went for? What was the... No, I spent a lot of time in Tokyo in my 20s. I had a, um, I helped my friends with a little clothing company, and then I had one. and I, So I went there maybe twice a year in my 20s, and I always um, just made a big impression on me. I have, and then I had friends there, and, and that was really the starting point for the movie. I wanted to make a movie about what it was like to be there, because it felt like another planet. It was just so different than... Yeah anything I knew about, and then being a, an American in, in Tokyo and what that was like. That just made such a big impression on me, my time there, so I wanted to make a movie about that. Yeah. Now, in relation to, you know, we're, we're going to be seeing The Virgin Suicide shortly, and this is a, a fascinating step away, for, you know, in relation, that was, the, the Virgin Suicide's made a, a very indelible impression, it's a very strong story, because it's Jeffrey Eugenides' novel, and so you're working from existing material, and here, with Lost in Translation, you were very much coming out of yourself. And I wonder if you could just tell us a little about Virgin Suicides and the next, taking the next step. Was that, you know, how, what was in your mind about the next development? Yeah, um, I wasn't planning on being a director, so I wasn't looking for material. I, I made a short film, but I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do in my 20s and, and sort of where the character of Scarlett Johansson came from. And when I read The Virgin Suicides, I loved that book. And I heard they were going to make a movie of it, and I kept thinking, I hope they don't do it like this, I hope they do that. And and then I heard they were doing it this way that sounded really dark and masculine, and I thought, they can't do it that way. So I I, I started working on a script, just thinking, um, as an exercise, I'll just you know write a few pages of how do you adapt a, a script. But I, I never thought I would keep going, but I got so into it, and I ended up writing a whole script. But really, it's an exercise for myself of how do you adapt a book into a script. And then, then I felt so protective of it that I tracked down the producers and somehow convinced them to let me direct the film. And luckily, they they went along with it. They had someone, but he had fallen out, and um, and you know, it was a very low budget movie. But somehow they took a chance on it. So I'm very grateful to yeah. them for that. And um, but I feel like that book made me become a director because then after I made that then I you know was interested in continuing yeah and then uh, then I wrote Lost in Translation after that which was the first original screenplay that was really personal about based on things in my life right right and interestingly enough you, you then moved straight to, to as a, I don't know straight but stri- you, the next film was an adaptation again you know and so it seems you're, you're alternating that, or, or are you? Because now Bling Ring is not based on, on anything. Uh, it was, it was adapted from an article. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. So it, it was the first, it, it was first time I've, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've done a, it was the first time I did something based on like a true crime story, which is yeah. something new for me. But it was an adaptation from this article. Right, right. Somewhere in between, because it's not the same as adapting a book where there's more material. Now, having grown up around, you know, I mean, in the world of filmmaking, I, I wonder if, you know, obviously you, were, you might have been pushing away from that with clothing and just exploring other options, but when you suddenly woke up a movie director having a book that you'd adapted, how about dealing with actors? Was that, was that a challenge for you? Was there any particular... Do you... Did you have a particular method that you'd see work, you know, when you were on sets, or what, how did you um, do that? Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely learned so much from being around my dad's sets, and he always, um, rehearsal was a big uh, mm-hmm. thing that he always talked about was important, so I learned about rehearsals from him, and when I was doing Virgin Suicides, he always gave advice about, you know, things to, to try, and, and improvisations we would do with the the family together, and so I learned about that, you know, from yeah. him, and then I took some acting classes to learn how to 
work with actors. I, I don't remember when. Maybe when I was when I was working on the script for Virgin Suicides, I did um, some acting workshops where they acted out scenes, mm. and then while I was writing it, which helped me look at the scenes and then give me ideas about writing it. So I found that helpful to learn mm. about that. Were you able with a with an actor like Murray? To rehearse it much, or were you were you just hoping to just because of his kind of immediacy? Did you work more or less without that safety net? How, uh, yeah, we didn't rehearse at all. He just showed up when we shot the movie. But um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he's he's so smart that I I knew that he would bring so much to it, and um, and it was really fun to see him improvise because I knew he was great at that from you know SNL, and, and, mm -hmm. and so I knew that he would bring so much. So much to it. Yeah. I knew you could sing. <laughs> yeah, that, that was one of all those karaoke scenes. They're great. And, you know, in terms of things that interest you, I mean, are you conscious of, of a pattern in, in, in what attracts you? Or, uh, you know, what can you articulate what it is that when you, when you cross the story of Virgin Suicides or, or Marie Antoinette or, or The Bling Ring, what, what, what is it that's catching fire in you? Can you, can you say? Yeah, it's hard for me to tell at the time. It's just, um, you know, either you get excited about something and it's hard to say why, but now because people ask me and looking back on it, I think there's definitely, you know, themes that connect them. And I I like um, stories where, you know, people are, are in transition or trying to figure out their place and, and kind of searching for their identity and, and the bling in the story that kids are trying, really trying to find their identity. And um, I guess I like when the... The drama comes more from an internal struggle, the character, as opposed to outside forces. Yeah, because it, it, what's what just coming, seeing the trailer, as it were. I, I'd love to see the whole movie now, based on that trailer. But I, but Lost in Translation, you, you're, you know, when the when the Scarlett Johansson character is standing outside the elevator, she's hearing people talking about their spiritual growth and all this sort of stuff in ways that you know make you kind of cringe. And what's interesting about what we see in the bling ring is the characters are our central characters are emitting that kind of talk and they're kinda of like they're a bit checked out on listening to themselves. So I thought, oh this is like a, a different a deeper challenge. Now you're actually going to try and get inside those heads of the people that we were only eavesdropping on before. You know? Yeah it's true this one is more the characters that I less identify with. So um, yeah it's looking at a different side of Probably a similar thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, we've got all these people here. I'm thinking we should start opening it up to questions from the floor, if that's all right. And I'll, I'll probably repeat some of the questions to, so you can hear them in the back. But you, sir, you, you seem ready to go. Um, really love the movie. Yeah, this question is about your sense of place, which is complimenting from film to film, but specifically with Tokyo. I mean, what? how did you, you know, kind of master all those spaces, navigating, because you're doing a lot of quick work. What, what was the, how did you go about communicating with Tokyo that way? Um, yeah, I mean, that was really the starting point of the movie, was I wanted to make a movie about Tokyo and my experience there, and then the story came around that, and um, I don't know, we were just winging it. We, we, were, we didn't have permits, and we would just run through the streets. And, it was working with very lightweight equipment. Yeah, yeah, small camera, small crew, and, um, and yeah, and, and um, you know, stealing stuff on the subway and in the streets and just trying to, um, yeah, just winging it. Yeah. In terms of the, the but the, 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 this gentleman's question is really good because it, you really do, I mean, virgin suicides, the, the environment you create around that house and yard is, is really indelible to me. I haven't seen it in almost 10 years, but I can absolutely call it back. And then, and, and with Marie Antoinette, I mean, we've seen other films about that topic, but the, you know, you create a, a whole dimension that she's in her own time warp in that movie, and, and uh, you know the music helps, but there's just something of your way of approaching those scenes. And I wonder how much preparation. Well, I mean, obviously you thought through in advance what you're going to do with Tokyo, but um, when thinking about the place of a movie, I mean, what kind of how do you gather for it from from film to film? What is there a different ritual prep? I always feel like that's a, a, a big starting point or an important element to me where the location where it takes place and that kind of sets the tone for the mm -hmm. atmosphere. So a lot of times that's the starting point or um, I don't know, it just feels like a big part of the story of the atmosphere of where it is and then, of course, the music and the photography, you, you build the whole atmosphere. Um, you know, in a way, I mean, thinking of Marie Antoinette, but even thinking of Scarlett Johansson, especially in the early scenes of this film, you know, where... where 
the, each article of clothing feels really well chosen. I mean, you know, like, like the characters chose it, but but at the same time, it's like there's a there's an inner harmony going on. It's more obvious in Marie Antoinette, so I'm thinking that you dealt in clothes. Is that, you know, do you often think just of those particulars about a character in the long foreground to a movie? Um, I mean, yeah, there's all the, the elements that can build a character and, um, and something, the, the clothes, or I always think of how you show the character with yeah. whatever tools you have, and, and part of it's the, the costume, so that's something I always think about. Yeah. And, and, yeah, maybe because I'm, you know, something I'm aware of and know about fashion a little bit that I think about that. Well, yeah, I mean, it would seem that you're, you're trying to also relate to characters like a bling ring. I mean, you're, how, how did you accessorize access those characters? <laughs> accessorize those characters? I'm too fashion <laughs> bound. But um, you know, in, in terms of getting into people that you don't that you don't feel an empathy for immediately, what kind of bridges did you cross to, to get there with these with those characters in bling ring? Oh, I mean, I tried to. The story was so out there. I tried to understand why they were. You know, get in their point of view and tell the story from their point of view. So I try to imagine kind of how they got interested in all of that. And, you know, I could understand being that age and wanting to be part of a group as, a, as teenagers and, um, and they were into all this kind of flashy fashion as a way to feel like somebody important. So I, I, yeah. I could, you know, try to put myself in that mindset and try to get into that. But it was fun because it was, you get to indulge in this kind of Trashier side. <laughs> <laughs> Your question, sir. Okay, this is an important question. I'll repeat it for the back. Uh, you know, there's fewer and fewer opportunities, uh, fewer, fewer, little less and less support for people who want to shoot on 35. You know, why did you decide to shoot the Bling Ring on digital? And, and did you shoot Lost in Translation on digital? Or? Oh, no. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, Bling Ring is my first film shot digitally, uh, so it was the first time for me. And um, I, I love film. But um, Harris Sabidi is my cinematographer. Felt like we should shoot Blending on Digital um, because he just felt like the support isn't there anymore for film. And I felt like it suited the subject matter. I always try to approach um, how you make the film is dictated by the subject. And, and Blending is um, very immediate and there, there's surveillance video and um, cell phone and... and internet images and we're kind of mixing up together all, all these digital yeah. formats so it made sense that it is, is shot on um, digital and and I was excited to, to for the first time to, to do that because I, I trusted um, when Harris said he could make it look good I, I trusted him that he yeah. could and I'm excited about the way it looks and I, and I, I was reluctant because I love film so much but. Yeah. your question sir let me grab Jack and then yours sir What's that? Who's your favorite filmmaker right now? Who's working right now? Yeah. Um, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, the thing about film is it's so fun to see different points points of view and different mm -hmm. kinds of films. So I can't say there's one person that I love. But um, is there a film, a particular film of the recent crop that that stood out for you that you just sparked to right away in, in, in a in a, in a, a recent movie? Yeah. You can ask me what movies I like in the past year, and um, I, I really like this movie, Royal Affair, the Danish period yeah. film that I um, I thought was really felt. A lot of times, when yeah, we showed it here. Yeah. Did, yeah, yeah. A lot of times, with a period film, you feel like it's it's a movie. You can feel that like um, yeah, the, the script supervisor is yeah. standing right there. That one really felt. I felt like I was really in that time. Yeah. So I, I really that one was the most the movie that recently I got sucked into. And I really enjoyed. Yeah. And the, the question, yes, right there. Yeah. Uh, when you're writing, when you're writing, how much do you visualize it on paper? Because you're saying that your compositions are very elegant, but does that come after, or are you actually pre-visiting it as as you as you write? Yeah, I'm, I'm imagining it as I'm writing mm -hmm. it, and, and my scripts like there's kind of notes for, for me to remember, you know, what I have in mind, and then I look at a lot of photo books and make references of things that remind me of um, how I want. The shots to look, but I don't. I don't storyboard them. I feel like I have certain shots in my mind, and then um, once I'm on set with the actors, watching them rehearse, then then we look at how to shoot. The mm -hmm. scene. Yeah. How did you train your eye? How did you train your eye? You know, just uh, I mean, do, do, do you do photography on your own, or do you paint, or what? You know. Oh, I um, I, I, I collect photography, and I love photography. So I guess that's where a lot of my 
I'm interested in that comes from. So, and then when I'm working on a project, I put together references from from photo books, and yeah. and, and that's and, and that's yeah where I get I guess the, the look. Mm -hmm. that's good. I don't want to neglect anybody over here. I got a ton over here. Okay, you first in the plaid shirt, man. Yes. Do you have any advice for young aspiring directors? Oh, I think um, just to to make what interests you and and um, and not worry if it will interest other people. Because when I wrote Awesome Translation, I thought it was really self indulgent and that no one would be interested in it. And I'm still surprised that um, it's had you know that people connect with it because it seemed like um, just really personal and indulgent. So I think I always try to follow what interests myself and hope that other people will too and um and i think now with with digital cameras you, um you know you can you can make things now it's it's more accessible so just to try things out would be my advice to just make them you know something that's actually a common thread that in your films i've noticed you know in that feeling of privacy it's like and this was very true of lost in translation makes it lost in translation makes it more visible more obviously visible is that um your characters are lonely. You communicate a loneliness right away, especially in Lost in Translation, but it's also true of Marie Antoinette. But what's interesting about those characters is they never feel sorry for themselves. There's no self-pity in them. And that's kind of like, I think that actually makes them really um, companionable to people in the audience because people can relate immediately to the loneliness and they don't have to feel like, oh, I'm watching somebody else's suffering. It's kind of like they can walk through the person kind of bearing it and going with it and, and just enter it. I, just oh, a, that's good. Yeah. I'm glad. Because <laughs> yeah. I felt when I wrote the character in Lost in Translation, like, oh, you know, who cares about some, you know, privileged girl that's not sure what she wants to do? Like, who cares? But, um, but to me, it was, a, you know, a hard time being that age and trying to figure stuff out. Yeah, and, so. you know, and her husband's neglecting her in just like the, the dumbass way that people will. I mean, it's like, you know, and you can look at him and say, oh, I've been that guy, you know? I mean, okay. you, you can, and so it's all very relatable. Now, let me get, uh, let's see, your question first there, and then I'll get to yours. Yes. <laughs> you take characters who are bored and suffering from boredom, and you make that really exciting. <laughs> oh, that's nice to hear. I, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm glad it's not boring to watch, too. And I don't, I don't know why I was interested in those kind of characters, but um, I remember I loved Safe by Todd Haynes and those kind of, um, that kind of malaise that, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's something I always have been drawn to, but yeah. And your question is way over there, yeah. Oh. This is great, and uh, I'll just repeat it for everybody in the back. You know, it's known that when you were doing uh, Marie Antoinette that you deliberately used, uh, just for inspiration, you used the color palette of macaroons to, to achieve that. And, and this woman is questioning whether, you know, in Bling Ring, did you find another kind of analogous palette and, you know, how, choosing colors, even for Lost in Translation, but how, how do you go about that? Oh, yeah, for Bling Ring, it was very, like, uh, I think from tabloids, like, all that kind of tabloid imagery and, like, neon and just bright obnoxious colors so the stuff that they were into kind of dictated the, yeah. the look of it and um, and everything was obnoxious and, yeah. and just every, you know too much and um, oh, the look of Lost in Translation I, I, whenever I'm um, starting a project I yeah put together these uh, scrapbooks of images like mood board and yeah. kind of things so, so I had images of like the Twinkling City from the view of the Park Hyatt and um just kind of the look of, of Tokyo, I think. But, you know, there's something that you chose very well in Marie Antoinette that I thought I responded to, which is that, you know, many... It, it was a controversial aspect of the film because you were using, you know, Bow Wow Wow, I Want Candy, all that great sort of 80s music, and you had kind of, as it were, tabloid colors, right? And people said, well, that's not Marie Antoinette, but I'm thinking, well, funnily enough, when we look at period pieces, costume dramas that are done in the 50s, if they get old enough, we can say, oh, that's a 50s costume drama, or something from the 70s, oh, that's a 70s, you know, it's a Ken Russell kind of 70s costume drama, and it's like, you took that bull by the horns, it's like, okay, this is a, this is a 2000, you know, year 2000 kind of period piece, but it owned it so fast that, that it kind of, uh, may, have, may have vaccinated it, I wonder. Oh, yeah, I always liked um, that you see those movies that were made in the 70s or set in the 30s, and that had that period affects it, but, um, yeah, I just, my, my... I, when I was a teenager, like my whole idea of the 18th century was new romantic 
and you know from Bow Wow, their album cover referencing that period right. and and Anna Maya. and so I wanted to make it in a new romantic feeling because um, I thought you know she was a teenager and it should be irreverent and and have that attitude and I can do it however I want. Yeah, so that's how she would do it. Right. <laughs> there you go. Now I'm afraid of neglecting folks way in the back. I'll get to you in a second there, but hang on. Way in the back. Yes, you sir. Thank you for coming and for making the film. <clears throat> I want to ask you about uh, the comedy that you found with the first Japanese director, the translator, and Bill Murray. Like, did you find that in the casting? Did you write that scene? Or maybe you could talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, I'm going to just, I think everybody heard it, but it's the, that wonderful comedy scene with the, the director of the commercial, the translator, and Bill Murray. How closely did you script that? How did you cast, did it emerge from the casting? Yeah, I mean, I had the idea of the scene, and then we were improvising it, and I would actually just call out things to the, the photographer. Oh, the still sheet was different. Um, I was thinking of the still sheet. I would call out things to the photographer and just throw things out and then watch Bill respond, which was, which was fun to do. And um, with the commercial, yeah, the, the guy who played the director, he was, um, I think he was like a Japanese pop star who was acting and... Um, well, the question had to do with how closely did you script that in advance, or you know, because it, it's such a—I mean, it plays on such unexpected things. You think, okay, how did you go about preparing and capturing yeah, that? That one, that one was scripted because I was always struck when I was in Japan because of the language. When I would do interviews, how long it would take to to translate, and then you'd get paranoid because they would ask me a question, and I would say like. Yeah, we shot it there, and then they would go on for like five minutes because it's just the way the language. Yeah, right. Is. So, so it makes you feel paranoid if you don't speak the language, and it's just yeah. So I, I thought to add to his confusion that that was the element of it. But the the one where he's doing the photo shoot was more improvised, where I would just make up things and throw it out to the photographer who didn't speak English that well. So I would say the Rat Pack, and then he would say it, and Phil would try to understand him. It was it was fun and interactive. Yeah. That's great. You had a question. Yes. Oh, the question is, you know, you've, you've chosen so many different genres from film to film. It would seem that the one you haven't landed on yet, and this is off your mention of Lauren Bacall, is directly into the 40s. Have you, have you thought of pursuing, you know, that sort of the, the 1940s, that kind of glamorous period? Yeah, I never thought about it. I love that period for the style and for the movies, but, um, but I never thought about doing something set in that. So maybe a story will jump out at you. Yeah. You. Um, I'll get to yours in a moment, but uh, let's uh, wait in the back. Yes, yes. I was just wondering It's a good, complex question. You know, your characters all seem trapped, you know, either by circumstance or some sense of obligation. And he's wondering, you know, is that that you're conscious of responding to that when you read a story or thinking of a story? And are you ever, you know, are you ever trying to, you know, let them find a way out. I mean, in other words, to, to outfox the, the sometimes tragic endings that overtake them. Yeah, I'm not aware of that going into why I like a project. It's usually, I just, you know, more intuitive. Like, I, I respond to something, but I don't know why, so I'm not thinking consciously to look for that. But um, I guess it's, it was something on my mind that, you know, we all find ourselves in certain circumstances, and how do you make your way and find, you know, your place in yeah. there. So it's something that I... Yeah. Oh, your question, sir. Yeah, it's asking about the connection between freaks and geeks, which has a couple of scenes in common. But yeah, yeah. I was influenced by that, but I think yeah. that was. Yeah. Recently. Well, how do you feel about being ripped off by? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that '70s high school prom is, is you know, you know, other people yeah. have been influenced by. There was a question. Yes, yes, sir. He's asking about, you know, your, your cinematographer who died not long ago. Could you talk about their relationship and working? Yeah, Harris Savides, um, I met him after I did Marie Antoinette. I did a, um, a, a commercial, and I met him, and I was talking to him about um, how I, the things I liked and didn't like about making movies. I was kind of exhausted after Marie Antoinette because it was such a big undertaking, and it was so complicated, and... Um, and I was talking to Harris about how we both hated doing coverage and how that was such a drag, so could you do a movie without that? And, yeah. and we talked about how... The, I just got excited about the idea of how simple you can make a movie, so I was really excited to, to write somewhere after talking to him. And then he shot that that was the first movie we did together. 
and um, and I loved working with him. He he just made the most beautiful images and the way he captured the light and um and I loved working with him. And then um, and Bling Ring he shot and that was his last film, and um, he uh, I just I just learned a lot from him and um, and he's yeah he's such a great cinematographer. Well, do you think that that is something you might take back with you to the next? Big production you do because I don't I, I don't imagine Marie Antoinette has put you off the the big ambitious projects but just you need a break from that but but you know I, I because of the Kubrick exhibit that's up at LACMA you know right now they, there's a sense that like when he's shooting Barry Lyndon he was not a guy who was into coverage much either he would watch everything and then find the right angle from which to shoot things and is that maybe are you conscious of maybe that entering your approach from here on to try and simplify where yeah. you go with a scene. Yeah, definitely. I think working with Harris and thinking about that, I um, I, yeah, I, I got into the idea of how economical you can be and how simply you can tell a story. And I think when I was younger, starting out of fear, you cover it too much because you want to make sure you have everything, and it turns into like a, a tangle of all these different angles. Yeah. And so um, that's something. Yeah, that I definitely um, was. It, great to learn about how simply you can how you, you can cover a scene and, yeah. or express that. Let's see. Uh, question way up in the back there, yes. Could you talk a little bit about choosing the songs for Lost in Translation and getting new music out of Kevin Shields? Yeah, could you talk about uh, the music for Lost in Translation and, and getting new music out of the songs that you chose and your process of choosing them and getting new music out of Kevin Shields? Um, yeah, for me when I'm writing, I always listen to music that... Um, feels like the mood of the story, so then a lot of those end up being in the movie, and um, I'm trying to remember, I don't, it's been a long time, um, and and that um, that song of his, uh, is it Sometimes, when they're crossing the bridge, I, I listened to that song, and thought that was such a romantic song, um, so uh, I talked to my friend Brian Reitzel, who, who, did the mus- who was the music supervisor with me, and we talked about this kind of... Tokyo Dream Pop, and he would make me play this, and, and, and the music was something that was a part of it early on. Do you listen to music when you write? I mean, is that a key part of your just formulation of the film? Yeah, definitely. I always listen to music when I'm writing, and, that, and I imagine scenes around music, and then a lot of that music ends up actually being in the movie, because I get attached to it, or connected, and it helps me write the scene. And then Kevin Shields... Um, yeah, I guess we approached him, and, um, and he was interested in doing something for, for the movie. And I think it took a lot of coaxing from Brian. But now I just want to check, when are we good on time? And we've got five, okay, good, we've got time for a few more questions. Uh, there's a gentleman in the green shirt there, and then, then you, yeah. I was just wondering, for the shots and lost translation, Yeah, this is a, a technical question that's very interesting, because part of, a great part of the the beauty of Lost in Translation, you got all these shots of arcing, as he says, around Scarlett Johansson while she's sitting at that window looking at the skyline. That, that, create, that could wreak havoc because of the reflections that might have been there. And how, how much of a Hudson painter did you have to be waiting for the right light, or did you fix that in post? How did you tackle that from a technical yeah, standpoint? We, we didn't fix that in post. We just, um, I guess he just shot around her, and then there's little bits that, that work. But I don't remember the reflections being an issue, so I think we just shot a bunch and then you find a piece that works, but I feel like in those days we didn't say we'll fix it later, now we do that so much, yeah. but I think because it was less digital, we there was less of that idea. Yeah, I wonder, you know, that whole thing of we'll fix it in post, I wonder if it's not if that's not a kind of corrosion that, that you can fight by actually you know, I mean this whole commitment that people still have to 35 millimeters. some of that is actually a commitment to uh, you know, just taking your chances, you know, and, and it's feeling, the, the feeling that we can only get this once, I think, must energize things for a filmmaker, too, that, you know, getting it right once. Yeah, I think you definitely approach it differently than, oh, we can just keep on shooting, there's more urgency to it, and it kind of puts more pressure and energy on Yeah, it. yeah. Uh, there was a question, that, yes, you, sir, yeah. I, I saw the playing reading. Yeah, I mean, he's talking about how you've been really growing as a as a storyteller from film to film, which is really nice to hear. And he's asking, what, how did you research, you know, the the language and the the world of those kids? What kind of prep did you do to enter them? Um, thank you. Yeah, I um, I just tried to 
imagine, um, the you know. The lingo is like. Oh, the lingo. Yeah. That's funny. I was just, I was just making it up. I was just imagining, um, <laughs> like that speak, and and I thought because there's sort of a revival of the '80s that the lingo wasn't that different from mm. when I was a kid. So, and then um, Harris V's daughter, who's in high school was my consultant. I, I asked her to read the script. And, and she's a very lovely young lady. And she told... Uh, the, the big difference was, I think, like the hip-hop influence because we didn't have that. So she's very lovely. And she told me, well, all my friends and I, we refer to each other as sluts, whores, or bitches. And um, so I tried to, yeah, incorporate kind of that hip-hop aspect into the, the thing. But, um, but otherwise, I was, I was winging it. <laughs> Gentleman in the blue shirt there in the center. Uh, you use real time so well in somewhere, and he's saying what, what in in the sense of tempo, what inspires you now in terms of. What are you? Yeah, it, we not many filmmakers have the courage to to take real time, as it were. And what are you exploring now that is kind of new or, you know, in a sense danger, risky? Oh, I don't, I don't know what's. Um different about this one as far as filmmaking I um, and somewhere it was yeah interesting to me to see how you could just feel like you're really with him and yeah. his boredom and watch him smoke a whole cigarette and I think after somewhere it was so um, slow and minimal um, then when I was thinking about this story I wanted to, to sort of I was in the mood just in the opposite that was really obnoxious and in your face and fast paced and feel like energy of these kids so for me that's new I don't know about as far as filmmaking but um, for me it was new to try to um, make it in their in their in the world of these kids in the story and and for me to do something that was based on like a true crime story was really different for me and how I would approach that but in my own way now now that that film is 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 coming out and it's kind of launched into the world I mean are you do you already have your next film lined up, or if you've got several in front of you that you're trying to choose between, what's going on? Yeah, no, I have no idea. We just finished this one, so I've been consumed with all the technical side of finishing it. We just finished it, so now I'm looking forward to taking a break and then seeing what um, I'm trying to, but I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Um, we have one time for one more question. Yours. So a lot of your characters have this... Wow. Uh, this question... You know, these characters have a lot of uh, internal energy and, and, and communicate uh, conflictedness. And the question is about how you do that, achieve that on a set. How do you how do you keep them alive in that space? Is that am I correct in rephrasing that? Or I, I mean, I guess you, you talk to your act. I talk to the actors, and then we have an understanding of what the character is going through, mm-hmm. so they understand what I'm looking for and. Um, what the character is going through at that yeah. moment, and um, so you, and you try to set up the atmosphere and just be clear with the actor of. What are I'm there things to... you don't tell them? I mean, in other words, are there things that you tell them in hope of getting them somewhere, and then at the same time, is there something you say to your cinematographer while you, you stalk yeah. around? Yeah, no, that's true. There's always um, <coughs> yeah parts of it that sometimes you don't reveal. It, it, yeah, it depends on the mm-hmm. situation, or, or it's always fun to have a scene with two characters and. They both are being told different things and watching how that interacts. But um, but those scenes where it's yeah, a character kind of going through something. I, I guess you know you talk about what they're going through, and I play music on set, so so that has an impact too. Well, whatever you're doing, it's working. It seems to be working every time. Thank you. And, and, yeah, thank you. Thank you.